You know, as a child, like many children, I was completely fickle. Fickle about all sorts of things. I would say um, you need to hear the truth, and that is that there was a time in my life that I loved Star Trek. I just loved it, although once I found out that if you wore a red shirt in Star Trek, it meant you were going to die, and something had to change, and I found Star Wars, and, well, the rest is history. We just love that, but we get so fickle about even little things like that. As I grew older, it was food. I was fickle about food. For instance, usually snacks. As a kid, I thought, you know, the Smarties. That was the only candy you could eat until I had a banana Laffy Taffy, and I never wanted another Smartie the rest of my life. We get fickle about all sorts of things, right? Maybe haircuts. We see someone that has a particular hairdo we want, especially when we're kids, like, should I go with the mullet or shaved up the back, that kind of thing. And we want to do whatever it is that our friends are doing. Clothing, of course, that would be one of those things. We look at someone and think, that is what I want to do. And as soon as the next fashion comes, we jump right off on that kind of thing, or at least we want to. We get so fickle about that stuff. I'll tell you what, though, as a, as a poor kid growing up, I had to be really choosy about what uh, kind of clothes I was going to wear. Like, do you remember, anyone remember parachute pants? Uh, any, a few of you do. I had a pair, but they were fake ones, and they were only shiny the first time I wore them. As soon as we washed them, they turned into sweatpants. I'm not exactly sure how that happened. But as soon as the next style came, it was, no, that is what I want to do. That's how I want to dress. Uh, cars, by the way, if you are a parent of a boy, let me just tell you that if you want to create something in your sons that is a constant discontentment with vehicles, go ahead and just buy them a matchbox car or two. Uh, and you get discontent with all sorts of things. And we think, oh, I love this. And then a little while later, someone else has this. And we go back and forth on all sorts of things. Music is another one of those. There was a time in my life that I would only listen to Journey in Boston. Loved those until I heard Metallica. And then I said, oh, I don't want this Journey in Boston stuff anymore. This is what's cool. This is what I want to listen to. And I even went through this phase where I listened to George Michael. Don't judge me. That's how it goes. And then there were girls. Girls. You know what? I have to admit something else to you. I, I never went through that stage where I thought girls had cooties. I always loved girls. And in fact, there were times where I would uh, sneak mistletoe, appropriate seasons. I mean, I didn't do it like in June. But I, I would bring mistletoe to school and uh, try and kiss all the girls in the coat room with my mistletoe. And I, I was fine with, oh, yeah, you're pretty. I want to kiss you. And then the next one, oh, no, I, I like you better. Let's kiss. And I got in trouble a couple of times for that. But you know, when you grow up and you see someone, you go, oh, that person, most beautiful person ever. I want to date this person, love this person. Then someone else comes walking by. Ooh, no, actually, I don't want anything to do with you. This one is beautiful. And kind of lived that life, at least until I met this girl. And this girl changed all that and have loved her ever since. <laughs> That's good. But you know, fickle is fair weather. And, of course, uh, weather is fickle as well. In Arkansas, our Arkansas weather is fickle. It cannot figure out what it wants or what it wants to be. But we know what fickle is. Fickle is fair weather. It's vacillating back and forth. It's inconsistent on one side of the fence one day. On the other side of the fence the next day, fickle is being blown by the wind. Wherever it may take you, that's where we go. Fickle is wishy-washy and double-minded, and it's really not unusual in our lives. We are fickle people. Do you agree with that? We are fickle people, changing frequently, especially in regards to our loyalties or the things that we love, the affections that we have toward things, or even the things that we're interested in. They change constantly. We're fickle about things like sports teams. Not me, I don't care, but some of you are fickle about sports teams, fickle about favorite restaurants, politicians, love them one minute, hate them the next minute, attitudes, maybe love. Maybe fickle about love and relationships, fickle about friendships, and maybe, maybe even fickle about church. Sometimes love it, and other times, I don't know. Or fickle about attending, or being a part of it, and growing in those kinds of things. You know, I'll tell you, over the years, many years of pastoral life, Every now and then, I'll have someone come up to me and go, Pastor, I absolutely love this. It is my favorite thing in the world, and uh, I'm going to be here every time the doors are open. In the back of my mind, I go, oh, I'm never going to see you again, am I? Because it happens so often. 
One minute we just love something, and the next we just, yeah, I don't know. We are fickle people, and I think even more sad is that sometimes I think we're fickle in our faith. Fickle in our faith in God, our walk with Jesus. Fickle, maybe. Sometimes, yeah, I totally want that. I want to follow. I want to do it God's way. But other times, I just really want to do it my way. And we love Jesus as Savior. So many people do. We want to be saved. Who wouldn't want to be saved? We love Jesus as Savior. Rescue from the gates of hell. But do we really want him as Lord in our lives? King, the one who gets the say. The one who tells us to go and we go. The one who tells us to come and we come. We love certain things. We love certain times. But are we fickle in our willingness to surrender and really follow? And you know, the Bible is full of fickle people. Uh, By the way, let me just tell you, as you look at the Bible and you see things like that, and the people that are fickle about their faith as well, This should do something good for us. It helps us to know, number one, that we're not alone, but also it helps us to know that the Bible is absolutely true. Because in ancient times, in the first century and before that, if you're writing a history of what's happening, you would not um, tell them negative things. And so people would say, well, the Bible's made up. Well, if they were making it up, why would they write negative things? The fact that there are negative things, the fact that there are people who failed, the fact that there are people who were fickle in their faith shows that the Bible is absolutely true. It's just one of the reasons that we know that it is. But the Bible is full of fickle people, Israel in particular. The entire nation of Israel seemed to be fickle. You look at somewhere like Exodus chapter 32, and you see the story where uh, the people of Israel Israel are tired of waiting on Moses. Moses has been on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights. He's receiving the Ten Commandments from the Lord, and they decide we need God here because with Moses gone, it's not here or something, and they demand that Aaron make for them a golden calf so that they can worship it. This is probably based on one of the Canaanite gods named El that was a bull. By the way, I'll tell you the truth. This is one of my pet peeves. That's why I don't like the word holy cow. Because it comes out of this kind of thing. There is no such thing as a holy cow. But the people didn't want to wait. Now, understand this. They just come out of walking on dry land at the Red Sea. They knew who God was. God had rescued him. There's no no question about it, but it's just one of those things how easy it is to get fickle. They saw the mighty hand of God in Egypt in rescuing them, and now they want to build a false idol to worship it because they think Moses is delayed. So fickle, so amazing, and that's not the only time. You look over at Exodus chapter 16, The whole community of Israel is mad at Moses and Aaron about being free because they don't have the food that they want. And it goes on in Exodus chapter 16, verse 3, if only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt. Now that's fickle, don't you think? Where we're so excited to be rescued from slavery, we're so excited to be free, we're so excited, but now we're not excited and we wish we were just dead. It would have been better for God to kill us instead of rescue us. This is what they said. And there we sat around pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted. But now you've brought us out in the wilderness to starve all of us to death. So fickle. Aaron was fickle. The people were fickle. Peter. How about Peter? I love Peter. You know, we give Peter a hard time and some of the other disciples when they fail. Uh, And I think we do that because we don't realize that they're living it out in real time. We have the benefit, when we read stories about characters like this, we get the benefit of seeing the whole thing. We get the beginning of it and the end of it. They're living it out in those moments, and they struggle at times. And I'm so thankful the Bible tells us about struggles like that. Don't you have a thankful thankful heart about that, that God reveals those kinds of things to us? I think so. This is important. But Peter has many failures. One of those, though, is in Luke chapter 22. This is where Jesus is telling the disciples, look, I'm going to go and I'm going to die. And Peter is like, no, but if you do, I'll die with you. I will die with you, Jesus. And Jesus says to Peter, you know, before the end of the day, 
you're going to end up denying me three times. And of course, that's exactly what happened. By the time the rooster crowed, he denied Jesus. How fickle. He's walked with Jesus all this time for years. He's seen Jesus do the most amazing things ever. And then in those moments of fear, he said, I don't know the man. I don't know him. I want nothing to do with this. I'm not sure how much more fickle you could get. Now, what's interesting about that, too, is that when you go to the end of the story, Jesus, after he's crucified and risen from the dead, he comes uh, back to the disciples, and he's cooking breakfast on the beach, and they come in, and he restores Peter, which is important. Isn't it beautiful that Jesus is willing to restore us, even in failures like that? He restores Peter, and he asks him three times, Do you love me, Peter? This is good. A three times of restoration for three failures, for three moments of fickleness, for three moments of denying Jesus. And Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Now, the word love there that Jesus uses is agapeo. It means that intense love, that direct love, that love, yes, of choice, but it is a sacrificial love. Peter, do you love me? Agapeo. The first two out of the three times Jesus uses that word. But you know what? How Peter responds to Jesus is he says, Lord, yes, you know I phileo you. Peter doesn't use the word agape. He uses the love of friendship. And so I think when you look at it, he's still fickle here. Peter's essentially saying, well, Lord, all I can commit to right now is I want to be friends. You know, many churches are fickle as well. We see it all throughout the New Testament. We see, for instance, in Galatians chapter 1, Paul is writing to the church, the entire church. And in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10, here's how it begins. He says, I am astonished that you have so quickly deserted him who has called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, and there's not another. Paul is saying to them, to the entire church, I cannot believe you've turned so quickly. What is going on? They're fickle. They've heard some other story that they like better, and they've gone that way, completely fickle. They've seen and heard amazing things, but even as an entire congregation, they go the wrong way. They're fickle in their faith. And of course, many of the people that follow Jesus around, as you listen to the narrative and you hear the story, especially in the book of Luke, as Jesus is going toward Jerusalem, the entire book of Luke is a travel narrative about Jesus going to Jerusalem. Why? He's going there to die. And the people are following Jesus around. They love the things that Jesus has to do for them. Jesus feeds them. They chase him around, probably because many of them just want breakfast. They got dinner. We, hey, this guy's giving out free food. We're going to follow him around. This is great news. And people are following him around. They're exceedingly excited about Jesus when they thought he was going to do something for them. When they thought that he could provide something. But they turned so quickly when he didn't do what they wanted. When he didn't do what they were hoping for, they turned. And this is the story of the Passion Week. So today is a day that we traditionally call Palm Sunday. And this is the Sunday before Easter. This signifies the triumphal entry. That's what we call it. The triumphal entry into Jerusalem. All four Gospels talk about this. Matthew 21, Mark 11, Luke 9, John 12. All four reveal this triumphal entry. But when you look at all four of them, you also see that it looks like Jesus actually comes into Jerusalem three times. The first time he comes in as priest on the Sabbath. The second time he comes in as prophet and he cleans the temple out and then he comes in as king as king this is important prophet priest and king this is a weeping jesus that comes into jerusalem because though of the people that are so fickle in their faith 
And so I want to take you to the story. If you look at Mark chapter 11, this is the second book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark. If you look at Mark chapter 11, the first 10 verses tell us the story of Palm Sunday. And I want to go through it with you because it's important understanding the story of fickle faith. And so Mark 11 verses 1 and 2, let's start there. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives... Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it to me. Now, this is an interesting part of the story, but what we understand about the colt and what we understand about this donkey is that it is the symbol of the Messiah coming in. The Messiah is going to come this way in one that is unridden, and has never been sat on before, also gives us significant, sacred purpose in all of it. And we see this from prophecy of the Old Testament. Written hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before this moment, Zechariah 9, verse 9. Chapter 9, verse 9. It tells the story of what is about to happen with the Messiah. Here's what Zechariah 9, 9 says. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The precise fulfillment of this prophecy should not have gone unnoticed by the people. The people that were there should have remembered this. The people there, especially the religious leaders, they should have remembered that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before, Zechariah prophesied this very moment in time where Jesus would come into Jerusalem on a donkey. And then verse 3, we'll continue. If anyone, uh, excuse me, if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and we'll send it back here immediately. Now, I think it's interesting that almost half of the story of Palm Sunday is about this donkey. Uh, about the, I think that's a funny part of the story, that we see so much detail in all of that. But I think it is to show Jesus' authority. When Jesus says, you go and tell them this, and they'll do it, it reveals authority in Jesus. Understand that when the Bible is written, it is a big deal who has the authority to do things. In fact, if you look at the book of Matthew, uh, one of the major themes of the entire book is about authority. Who has the right to tell you to go or to come. Of course, in Matthew 28, near the end of the book of Matthew, you see Jesus saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, therefore, because of that authority, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded. But it's based on Jesus' authority. So the book of Matthew is important to show the authority of Jesus because the book of Matthew is primarily written to Jews. And the Jews are having an identity crisis. The Jews are saying, yes, we're Jews, but we've come to Jesus. At least some of them had. And they're trying to figure out, are we still Jews or are we Jesus followers? How does this work? And the entire book of Matthew is walking them through that. How they were Jews that understood who Jesus was and how to follow Jesus. But authority was so important to them. And here, I think, part of what we see in Mark, Mark picks up this idea of authority to let them know Jesus is the Messiah. He has the authority. He is divine. He has foreknowledge of what is about to occur. All right, verses 4 through 6, And they went away and found a colt tied there and said to them, excuse me, and they I need to read this again. And they went away and found a colt tied to a door outside the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to him, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. The people recognized the authority of Jesus. When they spoke in the name of Jesus, they knew that it was Jesus, and they knew that he was the Messiah. Verses 7 and 8, And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it, and many spread their cloaks on the ground, on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. So they take their outer garments off, their cloaks, and they make a saddle for Jesus. They make a saddle on the back of this donkey, and then others take their cloaks off, and they lay them down in the ground, sort of like laying out a red carpet for the king. 
In fact, this is an example that we see from the Old Testament, not necessarily prophecy of Jesus, but a story of another king. We see it in 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 13. It says this, it gives us an example that this is what the people did. They hurried and took their cloaks and spread them under him on bare steps. Then they blew the trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king. This is an act of homage as they put it down. This is the king that is coming. We're laying out the red carpet and they cut off leafy branches. Now only in the book of John do we actually see that they are palm branches. In fact, in Jerusalem, those didn't grow normally. It was in Jericho, although they could grow palm trees in protected areas. But they have leafy branches and they have their coats. They lay them down for Jesus in verses 9 and 10. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem. You see, these verses are the key to the whole thing. These verses help us to understand who Jesus really is and what the people understood. And so the people, they lay these down, they look at Jesus coming, and they shout, Hosanna! Which from Psalm 118 we see, would be defined as save us, save us. They have high expectations that Jesus is there to rescue them, to save them, to be the Savior for them. They shout, save us, save us. And by the way, this would have been a typical psalm that they would have sung. The psalms were designed sort of as songs that they would sing to. And so these uh, Jews were used to singing this psalm as a psalm of hope and triumph as they're coming up into Jerusalem for the Holy Week. And now with Jesus there, they're singing it again and saying, this is the one, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. By the way, that last one is a customary greeting. They would have said this to one another as they passed each other on the streets during this point in time, getting ready for the feast in Jerusalem for Passover. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Verse 10 reveals the truth of the messianic message, that this is Jesus, the kingdom of our father David, the prophecies about the lineage through David. This is where the king, this is where the savior would come from. Hosanna in the highest, they shout. Now, we've probably heard something similar to this. I would say, Hosanna in the highest. As they say this, as Jesus comes into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, Hosanna in the highest is probably synonymous with glory to God in the highest. Is there another time in the story of Jesus that we heard glory to God in the highest? It was at the beginning of his life in Luke chapter 2. It was the angels shouting glory to God in the highest. And now at the end of his life, the people shout, Hosanna in the highest. It is the people praising God for the Messiah. They are crying out for deliverance. They need to be rescued. They expect that it is Jesus. And when you look through all four of the Gospels, it is clear that the crowds believe Jesus is the agent of the Lord that he is there to do it, that he is the coming king of Israel. And many of them believe this because they've seen the things that Jesus was doing. Many of them believe this because they heard Jesus teach. They heard Jesus preach. They saw Jesus heal and raise people from the dead like Lazarus. They had either seen it with their eyes or heard about it. And so this great crowd has great expectations for what is about to happen. And they expected Jesus to be king, the one who would save them from their oppressors. You see, ultimately, what they probably thought was Jesus is here to take over the throne and to kick out Rome, to kick out the people that have oppressed us for centuries. They expected him to be the Messiah king who would sit on a throne, an earthly kingdom. They were hoping, they were hoping for future savior a descendant from the house of David that would reestablish the throne and reign again. And here they are, Palm Sunday, proclaiming Hosanna to the son of David. They had great expectations. They were so excited, but there was a significant problem. There was a significant problem because Jesus 
in their minds did not meet their expectations. Now, let me step out of that story for a second, and let me just ask you, have you ever had people not meet your expectations? Anybody? Anybody? Have you ever had people not meet your expectations? Yeah? Okay, a little harder question. Have you ever not met someone else's expectations? You're like, yeah? Okay. And here's the hard question. Has Jesus ever not met your expectations? You don't have to answer that, but has Jesus never or ever not met your expectation? Like, you expected Jesus to do a certain thing. You prayed for a certain thing. You had expectation, and God didn't do it the way you wanted. Maybe he did it completely opposite, or you thought he's just silent, he hasn't even heard me, or whatever it is. Has Jesus ever not met your expectation? You know, this is part of what we talked about last week. Uh, if you weren't here, you need to go back and listen to that living unoffended message. Because part of what Jesus says in Luke chapter 7, verse 23 is, blessed is he who is not offended by me. And we live in a world of offense. To not live in the world of offense is different. To live unoffended is different, even when it comes to, to God, even when he does something different than what we expect or what we desire, to believe that he still knows better. We have to get our heads around that. But Jesus did not meet their expectations. They wanted a warrior king coming in on a war horse, ultimately. And here Jesus is on a donkey, a symbol of peace, peace between God and man. They wanted someone to come in commanding a huge army that would come in and destroy their oppressors, but instead Jesus comes in as a physician healing the sick. They wanted a ruler to come in and shed the blood of their enemies, but instead Jesus came to shed his own blood on a cross. So how did they deal with their expectations not being met? They wanted him dead. Crucify him. They didn't want anything to do with him at that point. When they determined he was not going to do what they ultimately wanted, they wanted him dead. And in one week's time, they went from this great celebration to a desire for crucifixion. That is a fickle crowd. Completely fickle about Jesus. The truth is, they were only sincere when they thought Jesus was going to do something for them. When they thought Jesus would accomplish something, fulfill their expectations in the present. That's when they were excited. They were sincere when it was popular to do so. But they wanted it their way. Their way would have had Jesus riding on a stallion. God's way was he rode in on a donkey. Their way was that he would become Israel's king. God's way was that he would be a humble servant. Their way was that he would save them from the Romans. But God's way was to save all of us from sin and death. Their way, their way, would have, he would have lived as royalty on an earthly throne. But God's way... God's way was that he would die for the sins of the world. Their way, though, would have kept us all lost in sin. Would have kept us lost. And let's be honest, are we really so different today? Would we have been any different? Are we any different now? Sincere when God is doing something for us. And only then. Maybe are we okay with God as long as he agrees with us? As long as he gives us what we want or expect, sort of like the magic genie Jesus thing. Like we have this perspective that God is a magic genie who owes us three wishes. Come on, God, I know you've got this for me. Or do we follow and praise Jesus when it's, popular to do when we're together at church 
Or do we allow our surroundings maybe to dictate whether or not we will praise him or curse him or just ignore him? That is uh, chameleon Christianity. Chameleon Christianity is we adapt to fit in with our surroundings. We change so that we blend in and look like wherever we are. This is the epitome of fickle faith. Chameleon Christianity. Do we worship on Sunday like heaven, but live on Saturday like hell? Are we singularly focused on the kingdom of God and his righteousness or double-minded, wavering, blown about here and there, fickle, fickle? We can be fickle in our faith or, or we can be faithful we can be fickle or we can be faithful proverbs 20 verse 6 says this many a man proclaims his own steadfast love but a faithful man who can find you know it's one thing to talk about it but it's certainly another to live it out every day to live out this faith every day consistently and so we ask so what so why is this so important then well, to be faithful is to be steadfast and unwavering. To be fickle is to be swayed by your surroundings. Ephesians 4.14 says, Like children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, this is not what we were made for. We were not made to be swayed by every smart thought that comes our way or every emotion that turns us. We were not made to be fickle in our faith. How about this? To be faithful is walking consistently with God in humble service to Him. But to be fickle is to put other priorities before Him. To be fickle is to put other things in front of him. Priorities of the world, entitlements, where I feel like you owe me this. Or preferences, convenience, entertainment. Oh, these are just a few of the idols that we so easily can worship before God. The things that come before him. To be faithful is life-giving in every relationship, out of love. It's an act of love to God, to our spouses, to our kids, friends, to our church family. It is an act of full and complete love. An unconditional love, no conditions. This is faithfulness, but to be fickle, it's destructive to every relationship we have or could have. But here's the thing, friends, we can overcome fickle faith we can overcome it it's part of why we're here so the question is now what or how how do we overcome a fickleness in our faith where we are so faithful in one moment and so on the other side doubting angry confused another time. Well, first of all, I will tell you, faithfulness over fickleness is primarily an act of God. It is an act of God in us. It is a work of God in us. And so here's what that is. When you become a Christian, God puts a part of himself in you. As you become a believer and you are grounded in him and rooted in him, he flows through you, and as you grow and as you mature, you begin to bear fruit. This fruit, the Holy Spirit of God in us, that fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's Galatians 5, 22 and 23. That it's primarily a work of God in us as we grow in him, as we follow him. But as Christians then, if you're a Christian in here, if you're a Christian and you're listening, we cannot continue to grieve the Holy Spirit though that is within us through fickle faith. Our wishy-washiness of faith 
that grieves the Holy Spirit in us. Instead, we need to allow the Spirit of God to live in us, to come alive in us, to flow through us, to live a life where the Holy Spirit of God feels at home in you. And if you're not a Christian, today is a good day to choose. Joshua 24, 15 says, Choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers you served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. That would be like the gods of this world. Choose today whether you are going to serve the gods of this world. And there are many, aren't there? They don't have to be carved out of wood or stone or metal and sitting on the fireplace hearth. Those idols are everywhere. The things that come before God Choose this day whom you will serve, the gods of this world around you or him. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But there's a second piece of living faithful instead of fickle. And it comes from cooperating then with God in the work that he wants to do in us. To say, yes, I'm surrendered. I will cooperate with you, Father, in the things that you want to do in me. The way that you want to transform me, restore me, heal me, strengthen me, lead me. I'll cooperate with this. Like it's simple as getting to know him. Getting to know him. Because you cannot love what you do not know. But to be purposeful about getting to know God. Or being devoted to him. Being devoted. That's such an important word. word. It was always the mission for the church. When you look at Acts chapter 2, you have the story. Peter's preaching. Thousands are saved. Thousands are baptized. And the church flourishes. And it tells us that the church was devoted. Devoted to fellowship. To prayer. To the apostles' doctrine to eating together, breaking bread together, communing together. They were devoted to this. We are called to be devoted to the work that God always had in mind as the church. Or how about having partners and accountability people in our life that when they see us starting to get fickle in our faith, they can call us out and go, no, I'm not going to let you go down that road. Who you surround yourself, it matters. It matters. Will you have people around you that will say, don't walk from your faith. Don't be fickle, but instead be strengthened and trust God no matter what you see. To trust him no matter what it is because God it may be working in some bigger way that we will never see or understand. We need people in our life that will come alongside and go trust him. He's good for it. And then how about cooperating with God in practicing consistency? Instead of being blown here and there, fickle, vacillating all over the place, instead of all of that, how about we practice consistency and time with God every day? This is how we get to know Him. This is how you build relationship. You spend time, time with God to be consistent in corporate worship. To come together because this is what God has called us to. To be consistent in attendance. To be consistent in giving. To be consistent in communing. To be consistent in serving. Matters of first importance. Not here and there and everywhere based on some other priority that pops up from time to time. That circumstances don't change our priorities. Circumstances don't change our faithfulness. But we are committed because no one can serve two masters. No one can. Matthew 6, 24. So back to Palm Sunday to finish it up. Jesus could have come as a military leader, as the people desired. But thank God he did not live up to their narrow-sighted expectations. Thank God that that's not all that he did. Instead, Jesus, the son of David, the son of God, the Messiah, 
came to Jerusalem to defeat the real oppressor. And the real oppressor was not Rome. The real oppressor was sin. This is what Jesus came to defeat. You see, he far, far exceeded their expectations. Went far beyond what they could have ever dreamed of. This is what he did, but it wouldn't be obvious until Easter morning. Only then would they see the truth in it. And his life and his death and his resurrection gives us hope. Hope for life, for eternity with him. So when we die, we live. And by the way, if you think you have messed up too bad to receive the gift of eternal life, let me just tell you that the way to get right with God is to come to him. The way to get right with God is to return to him if you've walked away. It is to come back if you've been fickle and blown here and there by every little thing, every little preference, every little circumstance. The right thing is to come back into relationship with God, to return. This is what Jeremiah 3.22 says, Return, you backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. He will heal our fickle faith. And that is good news. Do you agree? That is good news for us, for you, for me. That is good news for your friends, for your families, for your co-workers, for the people that you're around. It is good news for the fickle. It is good news for the insincere. It is good news for the CEOs. That is Christmas and Easter only crowd that we'll see next week and you know what we have a job to do and that is if you want your friends and your family and all of those people to hear the good news of Jesus the news that will change and transform their lives for eternity if there are people in you in your life that you want to enjoy heaven with someday you need to tell them the truth about who God is you need to not just tell them, but show them. Invite them to come be a part of this, this life-giving community. As we seek God together, your job is to get them here, especially next week, because with Resurrection Sunday, with Easter, it is one of the two weekends that people are at least open to hear something. Get them here, and then us all together, our job is to love them so well that they know that we have walked with Jesus. Salvation hangs in the balance, my friends, but salvation will also come to this place and there will be great celebrations in heaven. By the way, that's the only place there's no fickleness. And that gives all of us reason to cheer. Hosanna! Hosanna to God in the highest! This should be the great celebration of us still to shout Hosanna. So today, come. Today, come and repent of your sin. Repent of the sin of fickleness in your faith. And then start living as God wants you to live every day, every moment, faithful, not fickle. Father, I pray now that as we come into this time of worship, that you will set it in our hearts to seek your face. For those that don't know you or for those that haven't committed to follow you, I pray that you will draw them to, them, to yourself and that they will see truth in you. For those that know you and know you well, give them strength and joy to tell the story, the good news of Jesus, despite our circumstances, and for those who have been wavering in their faith, for those that are fickle, that love you one moment and ignore you the next, or love you one moment and despise you the next. Bring them to a place of repentance and help them to feel your restoration and your healing today. Help them to accept your grace and your mercy 
and to not offend you by not accepting your grace. Help each one of us to accept your grace and your love and to live it out on a daily basis. Father, as we take communion, as we break the bread that reminds us of your body broken, as we drink the cup that reminds us of the blood that shed, open our eyes to see what you have freed us from or what we need to accept freedom from. Heal us of fickleness. Make us a faithful people. Help us to cooperate with you in that yearning for faithfulness, always consistently to walk in your steps, to let you be Lord in our lives, to follow you. God, I have seen you move in amazing ways in my life, in the life of hundreds of people. Father, now I pray that you will move in the lives of thousands of people. That revival will come to the city. Revival will come to those who are fickle in their faith and have other priorities today or any day, but instead you draw all of them to yourself and that we will choose you over everything. I have seen you move. You have moved mountains. You've made a way where there was absolutely no way because that's who you are. And I believe that we will see you do those things again. That you will do those things in this place. That you will bring thousands to faith. I believe that you will do it again and again here and now. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to a time of communion during this first song. We have something very special coming up in the second. And so take this time to pray, to repent, to commune, to celebrate, to worship, and to ask God for a faithful heart, a faithful heart in everything. Let's do that now.